In 1997, Orange County, California native Ryan Shuck formed the death pop metal sensation Orgy and gained major success with a cover version of the New Order classic Blue Monday on their triple platinum debut, Candy Ass. During the recording of the group's third record, Ryan and co-founding member Amir Durak, formerly with the LA metal band Rough Cut, left to pursue their own project, Julian K. They immediately have success with the release of their debut, Death to Analog, and has music featured on the Sonic the Hedgehog game series as well as scoring the film Transformers The Revenge of the Fallen. Never satisfied with one stream of creativity, Ryan forms a new band with Amir along with longtime friend Chester Bennington and creates the soon-to-be supergroup Dead by Sunrise. It all comes to a sudden stop on July 20th, 2017, when Chester Bennington, Ryan's dearest friend, was found dead of an apparent suicide. After a few years of healing, Ryan returns and releases brand new Julian K music and tours with My Chemical Romance, him, Evanescence, The Birthday Massacre, and his longtime friend, Corn's Jonathan Davis. This is a 99 WNRR and Launchpad Live Vault interview with Ryan Shuck from Julian K. Hey, this is Ryan Shuck from Julian K. Orgy, Dead by Sunrise, and you are listening to New Regal Radio. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the Launchpad Live. I am Artifacts and on the phone I have, it's amazing, Ryan Chuck from Julian K. How you doing, man? I'm good. All right. What's going on? Thank you so much. <laughs> I got a whole bunch of stuff to ask you, actually. All okay, right. thank so, you so much. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm pumped to talk about this. Um, everybody, welcome to the program. And uh, this is uh, a really cool moment for me because uh, we have uh, just a great band. Uh, that's and you know I want to talk to him and I've got Ryan uh, Shuck from hi from from Julian K and we're to, uh, we're gonna get into a whole bunch of stuff but I want to talk about the tour first because that was uh, when I had gotten the email as far as hey you know what these guys are gonna be on this tour I'm like are you kidding me I just that's that's a really cool get and uh, for my money <laughs> the first thing I wanted to say was hey, they should call it the uh, what do they call it? The Revolution Three. They should call it the Rev Four Tour because you guys, you guys, have collectively probably more releases than all three of those bands. We we may we may, but you know, getting back to what you said in the beginning, like, oh my God, this is a really cool get. Um, that's exactly what we thought. We were like, oh my God, really? Three of the oh my gosh, it's the alarm that we're supposed to talk. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so funny. Um, no, we thought the exact same thing. I mean, we were we were kind of blown away. I mean, these are three of the uh, of the best bands in the world, and we were totally stoked. And yeah, we've done Dead by Sunrise, Orgy, and my work's been you know featured with, you know with Corn, which you know is big stuff. But yeah. this is a big deal for us. This is a very big deal for us. The, from a Sonic standpoint, because. You know, obviously, you know, touring with, you know, people like you know, KMFDM and The Birthday Massacre, where, you know, sonically it jives. This was kind of like out yeah. of left field because I was like, you know what, this is more, you know, this is more and more electronic, more industrial. And the other guys are kind of like, you know, pseudo alternative classic rock genre things like that. What was your first, besides being completely pumped about getting on tour with it? Uh, which is, like I said, yeah. a, a great a great way uh, to to have even new people exposed to the music. Um, what did you think about that sonically? You go, wait a minute, hold on. You know, this is really cool, but wait a second. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I mean, anytime we play with any band, we just like any great DJ or honestly any band, you kind of tailor your set to the bands that you're playing with, and uh, you know, you you very seldom unless you're headlining. You don't really go out and just play whatever the hell you want to play. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you know, the best way to get along and, and get people to kind of understand what you're doing is to find the songs in your work catalog that actually really work really well with those bands. And fortunately, we have 
quite a bit of work that works with, uh, you know, Stone Temple Pilots, Bush. Yeah. And, and actually, especially the Queen K is very much a th- throwback band. I mean, we, we reference everything from Depeche Mode to the cult to ministry to Nine Inch Nails, early Nine Inch Nails. Um, and even our, you know, other band, Orgy, which is now what, you know, nearly 20 years old. Right. It's like, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know the funny, th- the funny, th- yeah, the funny thing is that when you brought up, you know, obviously the bands that you reference, uh, you know, through through influences. But uh, I was I was checking out a couple of the, the tracks on the um, on the big on the time capsule, and uh, by the way, I picked it up. It was it was it's just phenomenal. It's a phenomenal package. Uh, so I like, so like, much. like darkest, dark, my favorite darkest days was like, you know, it's a song that you, I can hear on ultra, you know? So that was, wow. cool. I, I love, know. I love the vibe of that track. And just, uh, I thought it was really cool. I want to get into that too, because that's a, that's a big, broad conversation. That album is a, you know, a huge, huge effort and a major thank you to the fans who, who really went over and above for your Indiegogo campaign. And I want to talk about that on two fronts. Um, but what, what, what was your take on the response? And then, you know, wow, I, you know, I think it was over by 20 grand. I think it maxed over by 20 grand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, over by, over by, I, I think the, uh, I think we set the, the, the ask at, at 20 grand and we made 53,000 or something. Yeah. So 23,000 or something over, maybe it was 15 grand, but it, it, it kind of became, um, not really that important what the ask was because we knew that our fans and we, and even on our latest campaign, our fans, uh, did $20,000 in one day. So it's, it's getting to a point where we think that we're gonna have to move beyond the platform and the ask is just sort of like, uh, well, should we ask for more and, and just make it like a little bit more realistic or should we just blow doors on the, you know, should we set it at 5k and just do six, seven, 800%. Um, but to answer your question directly, I think that the time capsule package was perfect. I think it was a perfectly priced package and it was aimed directly at people who loved our music. Mm -hmm. And we spent a couple of years compiling music that we thought that they would love to hear and that, that we would be like, if we died tomorrow, the world would not be a better place if it didn't have that music out. And our fans resoundingly agreed. And, um, you know, we take our fans into consideration with everything that we do. We really think about what, you know, how many things are we selling? What can they afford? What do they really, really want? Um, and uh, and how can we get it to them in a really, really cool way? And Time Capsule was pretty much the pinnacle. And we'll see with Harmonic Disruptor, but with Harmonic Disruptor, the new album, we are literally funding for the first time a new album that isn't completely written. So it's a little bit of a new thing for us. We're actually kind of asking our fans to be our record label. Um, and so far, so good. But, uh, you know, we'll see. That's an interesting, you know, that's, that is a great statement. It leads into my next thought, which was, you know, there's so many, you know, this is a completely new world for, for, for artists. Uh, you know, we look at so many iconic bands, STP, Queensryche, uh, even, you know, Birthday Massacre did it before, uh, under, under your spell and all these you know, major established acts are all doing crowdfunding, uh, to get them to the next record. I, it's a, it's a very, very unique situation coming from somebody who was, you know, went through the, you know, the classic rock of the 70s, the big bands, the 70s, 80s and everything like that. And the way that the classic, yeah. the classic record, but this whole DIY thing has now completely changed the landscape. And it's kind of seems commonplace now. I think in the beginning it was a little, hey, wait a minute, hold on. You're a band and you're asking for money. Now it's now it seems commonplace. Yeah, um, I think that this is the beginning of a new model, and it could be like a cooperative thing between a label and a band. I know Birthday Massacre is doing something like that. They're cooperating with Metropolis, mm-hmm. and Metropolis probably acts as sort of like a manufacturing type of fulfillment arm. Uh, that that takes a bit of a load off of Birthday Massacre. Um, they're friends of ours. That's why I can speak you know, with well, a little bit of knowledge. I can say with us, we're 100% DIY, and mm-hmm. that leaves a massive massive amount of work on our shoulders for three guys 
Um, we do have some management. We do have a booking agent, but we're a small, small band, and there isn't a lot of money to split. You know, five, six, seven ways. So you have to be really, really careful. Um, but I do think that we're emerging upon a new model. And I think that I'm beginning to describe that model in my、uh, article on Control Forever called "Crowd Surfing Your Way Out of Hell." And it's really easy to find, but it's a very broken down, honest description of what it's like to come out of a multi-platinum status into an indie reality. That where where can that where can that all be found? Because I definitely want to check that out. Yeah, it's on Control Forever. And I am actually a, I'm actually writing a column on indie music business, and uh, it's uh, it's called "Crowd Surfing Your Way Out of Hell." And right now we're on the three steps that we took. It's going to be probably you know somewhere around ten steps and a little bit of commentary for me because if you read it, you're going to get a very very stark and honest analysis of what it's like to be number fourteen. On Billboard, behind In Sync, in Orgy, <laughs> and then and then walking in the desert with no water and no money and no way to find your way out. And what we did was we turned directly to our fans, and、uh, that's why I think the article has been so successful and so compelling. I mean, I have artists writing me privately, DMing on every network,、uh, saying thank you so much for writing that. We had no idea. You know, because on the outside, everyone thinks, "Oh wow, you've got a cool house, you own businesses, and there's all this cool stuff, and you guys are always releasing music." But the reality is,、um, we are struggling to, you know, meet a budget and a P and L and all、mm-hmm. this kind of stuff that any other business person would meet. And you know, the years in between being on a major label, they're really, really hard. And、uh, if it wasn't for our fans, we would never have figured a way out of ever. And now we have a new model. How do you have? How do you guys?、Uh, and obviously with management and and PR and stuff like that. How do you guys、uh, like to address the social media aspect? And what to you is more important when addressing that portion of the marketing,、uh, the marketing tier, so to speak? Well, we do everything ourselves, right? And we are just starting to outsource a little bit, and it's actually to friends who are fans. Um, and people that we have known for like six to ten years that we really trust and we really love, and we 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 we're at a point that, you know, we really think that they're more reliable and trustworthy than any label executive or marketing team.、Um, but that goes to one of the principles that I describe in my column, or but accurately enough yet, and that is your fans. Your fans are the number one resource of any fucking band. Oh, you can you can bleep that out. Sorry. No, that's、um, okay. But, I like、uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So if you don't look at your fans as the number one resource, then you should stop doing what you're doing. You should listen to your fans. You should also listen to yourself and let yourself guide what they say because fans can also come up with crazy, crazy stuff. <laughs> you know that you don't want to do. But you gotta really, really start realizing that these are the people. There might be a thousand people if you're a really big band. Like Orgy, you know it, the Corn stuff I wrote, Dead by Sunrise, probably sold 10 million albums, well, maybe 20 million. I mean, it's way up there. It's not. Orgy sold three, like just on the first two albums. So, or maybe on the first one, I, I don't remember. I don't. I don't really care. But <laughs> I don't have the ability to market to all those fans. So you go back to the thousand fan rule, which is in a really, really popular article. Um, and I reference it in my、uh, in my in my column. You go back to the you know it could be 500, 600 people that you know on Facebook, on Instagram, and everything that show up at every one of your shows, and you treat them like the rock stars that they are, and you service them, and you listen、hmm. to them, and you make music that you think they would love, and you know that there's you know, in our case, I know that there's hundreds of thousands of fans out there that probably. Would love what we're doing, and they probably buy what we're doing, judging by what we sell. But I can't market to all of them. I don't have two hundred thousand dollars to market. I have I have one hundred and twenty dollars. So, so you know, we we buy some targeted ads that are really aimed at our fans, and we use our own networks, and we focus very carefully on the fans that make a difference. And it's actually 
700 to 1,000 fans, and they are worth about $250,000 a year. Wow. Um, you know, yeah. That's a really... Yeah. That's a, you know, you went, you talked about, you know, you made the statement as far as, you know, listening to the fans and, you know, are what our fans would like to hear and stuff like that. And it's always, it's always the tough part as an artist because you could run that, you could, you always run the risk of being too self-indulgent in your writing and then you go, okay, well, our fans would just normally like this, but you know, you, that's a bold statement when you say that, you know, the, you know, thinking of our fans when we're putting this stuff together, uh, artists, you know, don't usually take that, you know, take that tonality. They usually take, well, we write what we write and our fans will love it any because of who we are. How does that affect you as far as a songwriting? Have you ever, is that it has, does that creep into the, to the songwriting process for you when you're, you're putting your, you're, you're formulating stuff and you go, well, I want to go here maybe a little bit, but then all of a sudden I think, man, I don't know if they'll like that. Does that ever come into, into play? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it, I, I call it the uh, dichotomy of leadership. So as a songwriter and as a band that people love, and obviously we had no fans in the beginning, right? So you had to make some choices and figure out what you wanted to do, and it resonates with people. But if you're going to be a leader, I think that you also have to consider the people that you're leading into the new world or whatever your new vision is. So the dichotomy of leadership is that you have to be individual, and you have to think of what you want, but you also have to think about the people that follow you and the people that support you. And don't look at that as a weakness. We look at it as a strength, as like we have this like really, really cool core group of people that we listen to. And we don't listen to everything. We still do what we want to do, but we let it guide us. Because sometimes the people that follow you and love you, they sometimes know things about you that you don't know. True. So you got it. You got it. You got to listen. You got to listen. I mean, if you're in radio, if you're in, if you're a writer, if you're in whatever it is you're in, you know, unless you're just, you know, just a complete genius and you can predict what people want, which, which I think is really, really hard. Um, and, and when you're young, you have to take that shot. You have to just kind of do what you want to do, right? And if people right. like it, then you're on to something. But at some point, you have to start thinking about what is it that resonates with people. Now, if you don't want to make any money and you don't want to be relevant and you don't want to, you know, people to come to your shows, I, I then, then I would recommend ignoring everyone. If you want, if you care about your fans and you care about the people who love your music, I would treat them like your family. Listen to them. Mm. Let them let them guide you a little bit. Yeah, I think I think yeah, that's a that it's a key because I don't think that many people don't realize, you know, the stock and and I mean truly listen. People can, people can say I think we're doing stuff for the fans, but to really and I think being a good listener, even when you're the even when you're the writer, being the good listener is really what gets it from point A to point B. Um, Speaking of that, and in that process, what do you think? I'm going to go back a little bit. For you, what what do you feel was probably was the strongest growth um, as a writer? Um, when you go back, like Death to Analog, uh, you know, all the way up to California, and then you know, obviously going back and taking all the stuff, and even some of the new stuff that you're working on for the new record. What do you feel is is the biggest? You know, I guess growth spurt where it's kind of like, you know, it's almost like, yeah, I always uh, attune it to, you know, designers or, you know, learn, you know, at least learning a craft and then all of a sudden the light goes on and all of a sudden, oh, wow, I can do this. And then it starts to flow like all the time. And it's, and it's almost like a fountain. You can't stop it. Um, when, what was that point for you? Um, you know, that's a, that's a, you said a lot of really relevant and um, the idea of a turning point where it starts to flow is, is very relevant. And I would say Harmonic Disruptor was where I realized that I, I could literally channel all of the influences and instruction and um, friendships and uh, collaborations and collaborators that I've dealt with over the last 25 years from Jonathan Davis who I was in my first band with, to Chester Bennington, which I was in my, you know, Julian Kay and my last band with. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it came out. I literally found out that I could do things. So I, I, I just decided, well, you do it like this. 
because I've seen it done, you know, all these different ways. And I just literally became a different singer on this album. But it was me. It wasn't a lie. It wasn't a joke. I wasn't filling shoes. It just, I just said, this album needs this. And I sang that way. And that, I think, is the biggest growth jump of my life. And we're still we're still finishing the album, so we'll see where I land. But um, all of that was built through my first band with, with Jonathan Davis. We're like, I mean, world, I mean, wow. I mean, can you imagine if you heard Jonathan sing for the first time? <laughs> I can. Um, and then being in a room with Chester Bennington before Linkin Park was big, mm-hmm. and then him telling you that he wants to be in your band, and you know, listening to him sing and put chills up your arm, and then singing along with him and having him kind of coach you and help you, and you don't always take it in. And I can say in Chester's case, when he left this earth, some of it came into me, and that influenced heavily it influenced harmonic disruption and that's i think when i when i literally could exhibit every single range of writing and vocal performance and all these things that i used to have chester just go no you just you stand like this and you and you and you you know you use your nose and you use your forehead it's not your chest and you just go ah, and you just sing this note that i was like Okay, yeah, I'm never doing that. That's yeah. ridiculous. Um, you know, and it's funny because we're we're playing songs that you know he performed on and sang on and stuff like that live for this for this new tour. Mm. And um, he's in some of the you know he's in some of the practice material, and I can sing all of it really easily. And I remember hearing it in the beginning, and I was like, oh, you know, he made it seem really, really, really easy. He literally said, this is easy. It's just like talking. And now I'm doing that talking. And if there was ever a gift, you know, I think that he gave that to me. And then, you know, performing with Jonathan um, at his memorial just, just you know, you know, less than a year ago. You know, what a great, what a great idea from Lincoln Park to put us with Jonathan, my first, the, like the first people that came together and created this rad I don't know, revolution in music that started with the song Blind, you know, but us being together again and rocking it and just going like, wow, you know, we started it in the same room in Bakersfield, California. And we're here with Lincoln Park in front of hundreds, if not millions of people, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people worldwide rocking it. And we're on this level. And, and these kind of things like help me like break through my own wall you know that's just the way i think and that's that's what i'm grateful for and that's what people have done for me you know yeah how how often uh, yeah how often does he cross your mind every day every it was every minute um now it's every you know day probably 20 times a day i was waking up for the first time in my life, I, I didn't know you could wake up bawling, crying, but I did that for months, um, and that was a that was a horrible experience. Um, he still haunts me a little bit in my dreams, and when I say haunt, I just mean he's there and I can't get him. You know, yeah. I can't get to him, I can't hug him, I can't touch him, and that's usually when I wake up crying. Um, but that 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 is. It's a phenomenon that I've never experienced before in my life. You know, waking up crying. Um, you know, the idea of just picking up your phone and texting him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's that's an odd. It's an odd thing because he was such a part of everything. And now I'm writing an album. You know, and Harmonic Disruptor was going to be us going back to our roots and all this disruptive stuff that we did in Orgy and even early Corn stuff and all you know detuned guitars. And now it's all of that plus dealing with the death of, of Chester and it takes on a whole new meaning so he's part of all of this you know I think of him I think of him with every song you know and I'm going to be playing as Dead by Sunrise on multiple shows at, you know memorials for Chester uh, this year uh, and I have a feeling that that's probably going to be my July for the rest of my life mm-hmm. and that's okay because I have to fight to keep his energy alive and keep the mark that he left in the world alive and I'm willing to do that 
I'm down. I'm down. Do you think that this has, well, I don't do you think, but this whole process with Harmonic Disruptor, how is that, has it been cathartic for you? It's going to get there, I think. Um, I think that just me channeling him definitely helped because I was able to scream. And there's a part of me that's angry. There's a part of me that's very mad about what happened. Mm -hmm. But I said in his eulogy that I'm not mad at you. He said that I understand why you did what you did. I understand the uh, mental illness and depression that, that can that can crush you because I suffer from the same thing. We suffer together. He just, you know, went went a little further. And you know, making the album is a chance for me to scream and a chance for me to yell at not him, but at the world, at somebody, at something, at the dark passenger, you know, the, the illness that rides within a lot of us that love our music. It's my chance to shout it down and crush it and punch it. And, uh, at the same time, I have to try to be myself and try to let myself shine through. But how much of me is the pain? right now of losing in my opinion the voice of our generation and one of the best friends I've ever had in my life I think that I I I just think I go in having to deal with that you know situation myself I just think that having oh, having the, having the outlet having the outlet that you have to do that and like you said you know it's when you hit a heavy bag and you just keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it, you just don't stop until you reach yeah. to a point where you think you're going to pop and your head's going to pop off. And then all of a sudden you hit that last, you hit, the, you hit that last right or left. And all of a sudden you breathe big and then you're exhausted because you, you spent it all. Yeah. And, and then you, yeah. and then all of a sudden you go to sleep and you wake up and you can breathe deeper in the morning. And you don't feel so constricted. I think you just described um, catharsis. I, I actually couldn't describe it before. And I, I now think I have some sort of metric to measure whether or not I can reach it. Because I think that you're right. I think that there was a, a lot of anger that came out in the initial songwriting process. And I think that right now I'm kind of sitting in mid catharsis. Like a little bit of like I can do my life. I'm not okay, but I just I just screamed a lot. I just yelled a lot, and it looks like fans really like it. I like that because I like my fans a lot. <laughs> I like our fans. I like the people who support us. And uh, and uh, you know where it goes from there, we'll see. But I think that uh, you just described for me. Actually, I just learned something. I think you just you just made actual catharsis uh, defined for me. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's uh, you know it, it is something it. That moment when you're going to be able to breathe and you're going to be able to feel that release and it's not you're not going to feel that pain anymore is I hope comes for you soon. So I am looking forward to uh, coming out. So far right now, I'm looking like I'll be at the um, I'll be at the PNC show. Uh, I'll be doing a, I'll be doing a, a, a report on that one too. But I'll be at the PNC show and I'm also looking at uh, going to the uh, the Philly show at the Voltage show. If we get, if I know oh, the, that'd be great. the voltage, um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'll give you a text. Maybe we can uh, spend some time. I would absolutely love it. I would recommend coming to a headlining show because the uh, the big, big arena shows are mm -hmm. going to be a little bit shorter. And if you come to a headlining show, you're probably going to get like a full production light show in a club and a whole deal. And you'll actually see kind of what we do. And um, it'll be even more comfortable for you and I to hang out and talk and, and like get some more stuff going on. It'd be really fun, I think. At the Estes, that's that's a headlining show too, right? At Hard Rock, Atlantic City, I think is with Bush, Stone Temple Pilots, yeah. and the Cult. So okay. that's a big, big tour. Yeah, that's that's big. probably gonna be us opening. It'll be like probably you know 25, 30 minutes right. max. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if they made it twenty. <laughs> Jesus, that'll be uh, that'll be the quickest that'll be the quickest five songs you've ever seen. Um, then, let, then let's make it let's make it voltage then. Yeah, yeah. Um, coming out to the big shows is cool because you get to see a, a new group of people you know enjoy us. But uh, you know, you come see our show and you're going to see the whole thing. Now I'll make it out to the voltage. 
Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'll make it out to that'd the Philly awesome. show. You just text you text me and I'll make sure that you're on and we'll take care of you and, and come back and hang out. And we'll uh, we'll talk more. That'd be awesome. I'm looking forward to it, man. That's this is uh, this is this is this has been well, well, just something that just organically flowed. And I love I love having conversations like this. I don't really do per se interviews. I love having conversations, and um, I, I'm looking forward to that moment when you can breathe again. I really am. Thank you so much. And this was actually a very very cool and nice interview to do with someone who's very intelligent and knows what the hell they're talking about. So I really appreciate it. Thanks.